The year was 1997. Many notable things took place during those 365 days. An unknown author by the name of J.K. Rowling would successfully release a book called Harry Potter. Genetic engineers cloned Dolly the sheep. And let's not forget... <laughs> Perhaps the most important event of that year, however, was the fact that for the first time in our history, mankind put an artificial body on another world. On July 4th, 1997, NASA's iconic Pathfinder spacecraft landed on Mars, deploying a small rover named Sojourner. This precious marvel of technology spent 83 days exploring the Red Planet and propelled us into a new era of exploration. Traveling 312 million miles between our worlds, the trip took an astonishing seven months at a dizzying speed of 16,000 miles per hour. The Pathfinder mission made space travel so much more tangible to us. For the first time, we could roam and see the terrain of another heavenly body. In the years that followed, the next logical question was, could we ever go there? And how on earth were we going to make that happen? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The More You Know, a channel that explores phenomenons in nature, culture, astronomy, and more in the pursuit of knowledge. Okay, so assuming that it was possible, and I want you guys to really think about this, would you actually propel yourself into space, travel an untold distance to an alien world? I'd like to think hell yeah. Of course, the reality of such a audacious endeavor is going to be way more complex than we can imagine. Nonetheless, we humans are dreamers, and where there's a will, there's probably a way. So in order to grasp our minds around this very complex subject, we need to start out broad and get more specific when it comes to space. We live in a tiny solar system in the outer reaches of the Milky Way galaxy, a collection of billions of planetary systems stretching 100,000 light years across. Hidden between the outermost gas giants and a medium-sized sun lies the terrestrial planets. These include Mercury, Venus, and Earth, the only celestial body we know to have life. Among these rocky worlds lies Mars. The fourth planet from the Sun, this small, geologically inactive world is frozen in time, essentially a written record on the formation of the solar system. It's thought that Mars was once more Earth-like before it lost its magnetic field and shed its atmosphere. A strikingly familiar terrain covers the planet, its alien landscape bathed in an ever-present red hue. The Earth, nothing but a small star in the Martian sky. A major reason that scientists are so interested in Mars is because, as stated earlier, it's a geologically inactive world. This means that we can learn more about the origins of not only our solar system, but the Earth itself. It's now widely thought that Mars actually had an atmosphere and liquid water at some point. Water and oxygen means life. And if ancient microbial life ever existed on Mars, then evidence of that would be in the soil. Imagine the sheer significance of a second genesis. We also have to keep in mind that if humanity intends to survive a long term, we're probably going to have to leave the Earth because it's just going to be inhospitable at some point. Video idea! So yeah, it's probably a good idea to keep the Red Planet in mind if we ever intend to colonize. The concept of colonizing Mars is nothing new. Ever since the planet's discovery by Galileo in 1610, the greatest of minds have conceptualized what this could look like. From underground bunkers to transparent dome-like structures, we won't know the true design of such a facility before we understand the Martian terrain and how best to adapt if we are to be successful. Form follows function, and whoever takes on this mammoth task will be up against currently unknown challenges. Bottom line, humans are made for Earth. We need to find a way to adapt within our limits, but also recreate life-sustaining systems to give ourselves our best chances moving forward on the Red Planet. We need to protect our physical and emotional well-being. We have to consider the consequences of what one-third Earth's gravity will do to us and our offspring. We have to accept that we'll never be able to walk outside and take a deep breath of fresh air in a negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can't slip up, like ever. I mean, have you ever seen- <laughs> Not a good look. Not to mention the cancer risks, which is going to be high with deadly solar radiation. We're going to have to hope that we have the means to combat that by then. Whoever colonizes Mars is going to have to accept the reality that they're going to be fortifying themselves on a world that they're not meant to live on. 
Mother Earth. At 4.5 billion years old, this miracle of the cosmos gave birth to the very fabric of your reality. Every person you've ever met, every thought in your head, every morning you get to wake up is only possible because this planet harbors the conditions for life. So unlikely was this reality, it's a miracle we exist at all. Earth has it all by our standards. Temperate weather, an oxygen-rich atmosphere, and liquid water, which creates diverse biological niches where life can flourish against all odds. Mars, on the other hand, is a stark contrast to the planet we call home. Its barren desert seemingly stretches forever, its haunting beauty untouched by time. These very real images capture a serene yet frighteningly rigid geography. Imagine a world where nothingness is the norm. We can't help but appreciate our world that much more. All right, so full disclosure, I am not a rocket scientist or a colonization expert of any kind. You could make hundreds of videos discussing multiple topics on this subject. What I'm choosing to focus on is not so much the feasibility of colonizing Mars, which I do believe will happen, but rather the why. I mean, what would we actually do there? First, we'd want to study the planet to make comparisons about the Earth. Next, we'd want to study the biological processes of Mars to better understand the questions that we have about life. Mars has surprisingly useful resources that we could tackle to answer these questions. Let's talk about geology. What makes Earth and Mars both similar and different at the same time? Colonizers will want to understand how the roles of wind, water, volcanism, tectonics, cratering, and other processes acted to form and modify the Martian surface. For that, you need a tangible study. This will enable scientists to compare and contrast data and ultimately add to the collective knowledge on this subject. Climate. A main priority in this exploration of Mars would be understanding the current climate what the climate was like in the distant past, and what specifically caused climate change over time. This will be immensely important in combating issues of climate change back here at home. And then, of course, there's life. As far as we know, all life is dependent on water in some form. Evidence of once flowing liquid water teems on the planet's surface, a good sign that microbial life, or at least complex molecules, may once have existed. It's also possible that hot spots like hydrothermal pools may exist under the surface where life may possibly thrive to this very day. It's also been confirmed that water ice exists on the North and South Poles. These theories build a strong argument for the possible presence of life. As for the colony itself, we can imagine a very practical system of habitats with multiple purposes. We would want a collection of working laboratories, greenhouses, water processing equipment, perhaps even spaces to keep animals and study their biology in the Martian environment. We would also have to take into account the human condition and design recreational spaces to keep people's mental and emotional health at a stable level. A great example of what this can look like can be seen in National Geographic's Mars, a mini-series that hypothesizes a future where a Martian colony advances through the trials and tribulations on the Red Planet. This series also explores important discussions around space travel, economic impact, and complicated social issues colonizers could face. Alright, so we have the general concept down, but what would it take to make this more feasible from an economic point of view? Whether on this planet or the next, money talks, and whatever we end up choosing, however we go about this, it's going to have to make economic sense. So how do you solve the money problem? The answer is reusable space technology. Our current system makes use of non-renewable space machinery that either gets burned up in the atmosphere or becomes part of space debris. If we want space travel to be more economic, we have to cut costs and become more sustainable. Much of the cost of space travel occurs before anything leaves the ground. Complex facilities create and maintain components of rocket technology. Fuel in and out of itself is an incredibly expensive resource alone. A big contributor to advancing space tech are private companies that don't rely on government funding. This enables them to work at their own pace, often without restriction. SpaceX, a leading pioneer in this field, is helping to reinvent the industry. 
even succeeding in creating the world's first reusable rockets. CEO of SpaceX Elon Musk hypothesizes commercial space flights where a ticket will cost a mere $2 million, as opposed to the average $152 million that NASA spends on space launches today. We interrupt your local programming for an important community announcement. Are you bored on Earth? Tired of the same mundane routine? Book a trip to the beyond in the world's first reusable rocket technology. Normally $152 million, we're slashing our prices for a special introductory offer of just $2 million. That's $2 million, folks. Participant must accept calculated risk of death. Hidden fees may apply. Must be 18 or older to ride. Tickets may be restricted to members of the United States. What? 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 Nobody said it would be cheap. Still, the cost of 1% of what it takes to send a rocket up into space now is a step in the right direction, wouldn't you say? Now we need to talk people. Who would be eligible enough to actually colonize this place and call the Red Planet home? Candidates for NASA's astronaut program essentially have to be genetically flawless. Considering the sheer amount of physical and mental stress these people will endure up there, we need to make sure that we're sending the best specimens of humanity to increase our chances of long-term survival. Candidates will first need to lead a healthy lifestyle and show proof of physical fitness and endurance. Folks who are genetically prone to conditions like asthma, heart disease, cancer, and other disadvantages most likely will not be eligible. They will also need to hold specific personality types that reflect complex problem-solving skills, the ability to work under intense pressure and carry out positive social relationships in situations that may cause boredom, tension, and depression. Endurance will be key, and for those small number of people selected, they will have to represent the most robust among the population. These will be the top in their classes in their chosen fields. Geologists, scientists, doctors, mechanics, and other typologies will need to coexist and work in harmony to achieve positive long-term missions. And there, my friends, you have it. Admittedly, yeah, this is a really broad subject, and as I stated earlier, I can make hundreds of videos discussing different aspects of this topic. But isn't that what makes Mars so truly timeless and exciting? Nobody said it was going to be easy. It'll take a national effort and tremendous resources, probably from every corner of the globe. But it's not impossible. If we want it bad enough, we're capable. I mean, we landed on the freaking moon and currently occupy the International Space Station, an amazing feat of human ingenuity and technology. What do you guys think? Is this feasible? Do you really think we could or even should colonize Mars one day? Let us know in the comments below. If this video gets 200 likes, I'll make a new video based upon your suggestions. If you'd like to learn more about the topics covered today, I have links posted below. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. If these subjects interest you, I invite you to like, share, and subscribe. I do plan on uploading regularly. Remember, stay curious, stay kind, and never stop asking why. I'll never let go, Jack.